All right, Bio 2 folks, we are on chapter 28 on proteasts, okay? And um, proteasts are eukaryotic, okay? So we finished prokaryotes, and now we're moving on to eukaryotes, and we're going on to, pro bleh, on to proteasts, which are the um, earliest eukaryotes that arose, okay? Proteasts are the earliest eukaryotes that arose. Now, what I'm going to go over on this slide is the theory of endosymbiosis. Okay, we you can also call it the endosymbiont theory. Okay, so theory of endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis would be spelled E N D O S Y M B I O S I S, or we could say endosymbiont theory. This theory explains the evolution of eukaryotes, okay? And I love this theory. I think it's just fascinating. Okay, so let me walk you through this, okay? And then I'll also walk you through the evidence for endosymbiosis. Before I go through that, let me uh, define the terms. Um, endo means inside, okay? Endo means inside. Symbiosis, okay? Now, when two organisms interact with each other okay you can have an organism interact with another organism and cause harm okay so for example diseases right uh, a disease agent that interacts with let's say a human and it causes harm that would be considered a parasite okay depends on exactly who you talk to the definitions can be slightly different if two organisms interact with each other and help each other you can call that a like symbiosis or mutualism okay um so endosymbiosis basically means two organisms interacting with each other okay inside the cell okay so all basically symbiosis is two organisms interacting with each other endo meaning inside all right, now, how this, this, this theory is, it start, you start out with an ancestral prokaryote, okay? So we've already pretty much established the first organisms were prokaryotes, so the ancestors of all of life is a, was a prokaryote, okay? So here's your prokaryote where you've got um, a membrane, okay? You've got DNA, you've got cytoplasm, but that's it no organelles, no nucleus. Now it's believed that the endomembrane system and the nuclear membrane arose from invagination of the cell membrane. Okay, so basically here's the cell membrane and if it starts to pinch inwards, okay, so you see it's pinching inwards. Okay. So if the membrane starts to pinch inwards, that's called invagination. So it pinches inwards and can ultimately surround the nucleic acid material, okay? Some of that membrane will go into the cell and surround the nucleic acid to form the nuclear membrane. Okay. Some of that membrane invaginates and forms folds to form the endoplasmic reticulum which is a key part of the endomembrane system. You should remember the endomembrane system from bio one. Okay. So the endomembrane system, the endoplasmic reticulum, nuclear envelope, all just arose from invagination of the membrane. Okay. And then you've got the nucleus that's formed. Okay. Now, um, then what, and this you would often, we would, you can, we can call it a proto eukaryote. Proto kind of means before, okay, before you've got your formal eukaryote, okay. So the cell with the nucleus. Now, you'll see this when we get to amoebas and hope, maybe you did already get this when you went over that part in your lab manual, okay. But um, some cells are able to do what's called phagocytosis, and it can move its membrane and wrap around something else and bring it in, okay? 
So its membrane can move around with and wrap around something and bring it in. Okay. So this proto eukaryote with a nucleus is believed to have wrapped around a another prokaryote okay and this other prokaryote would be a bacterium and it's a bacterium that can do aerobic cellular respiration okay because remember we already said some prokaryotes can do aerobic cellular respiration and some can't now once the the oxygenation of the environment occurred before the first eukaryote arise, arose. So there would have been bacteria that used oxygen and did aerobic cellular respiration. Okay. So this proto-eukaryote engulfed this bacterium that can do respiration, and then it established itself. And it this one lived in symbiosis with the engulfing bacterium. These two bacterium live together so, so well that the, this bacterium ended up losing some genes, okay? They cohabitated so well that they had some extra genes and this one kind of lost some genes to be able to live on its own. When it lost the genes to live on its own, it basically became dependent on this the engulfing cell and it established itself as a mitochondrion okay the mitochondrion organelle which you know the role of the mitochondria is aerobic cellular respiration okay. so mitochondria arose from engulfment of a bacterium that does aerobic cellular respiration and that gave rise to your ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote now, let me go to the word heterotrophic. I sort of used, did some of this when we did um, prokaryotic metabolism. And trophic means feeding, okay? So how does it feed? Hetero, hetero refers to organic compounds. So in the prokaryotic slide, I use the word chemohetero, okay? Whenever you see hetero, hetero means variety. Whenever there's a variety of carbon sources, it's going to be organic. So heterotrophic is basically the same as chemoheterotrophic. Okay, I want you to know heterotrophic is equivalent to chemoheterotrophic because hetero refers to organic chemicals. Okay, so this would basically give rise to an ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote that takes organic carbon compounds, brings them in, and does aerobic cellular respiration to make ATP, which you're familiar with. Now, this ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote, or basically this, this precursor before full establishment, this one could have then engulfed a second bacterium. Okay, in, So you see here, it's engulfed one bacterium it engulfs a second bacterium and the second bacterium it engulfs is one that can do photosynthesis okay because we know bacteria can do photosynthesis some of them can okay that's why it's shown as green okay now that one ends up residing in that cell and it's already got that aerobic bacterium that's established itself as a mitochondrion this photosynthetic bacterium that got engulfed lost certain genes because they didn't need it anymore because those uh, functions got taken over by these two, okay, by the genome from this uh, mitochondrion and from the genome from the nucleus, okay. So it lost genes such that it established itself as an organelle, okay, and an organelle that can do photosynthesis okay and the word plastid okay plastid is similar to chloroplast it's not exactly chloroplast but it's very similar okay so you'll often see me using the word plastid and chloroplast somewhat interchangeably okay a plastid is a structure that can do photosynthesis just like a chloroplast 
might be some slight differences. Now you have a cell that has both mitochondria and chloroplasts, right? Has, has organelle that can do respiration as well as an organelle that can do photosynthesis. Okay. And so now what you have is, is an ancestral photosynthetic eukaryote. Remembering that plant cells have both mitochondria and eukaryote, um, mitochondria and chloroplasts. Animal cells just have mitochondria. So you can see this is the ancestor for animals, okay, and fungi. This would be the ancestor for plants, okay, and you know other uh, and proteists, okay. The both of these would be proteists, okay. All right. I hope this is clear for you. Um, sometimes people have trouble with this. Um, if you have trouble, just ask. But really, probably the best thing to do is just draw it out, okay? And it should be, you know, pretty clear. Now, what I want you to know is mitochondria contains DNA, okay? You might have heard of mitochondrial DNA. And that makes sense because the bacterium that engulfed, got engulfed had DNA, right? And the, and so a lot of the genes you know, stuck around in the mitochondria. Some of the genes um, that moved from the mitochondria into the nucleus, okay? But yes, there is genetic material in the mitochondria. Of course, you already know there's genetic material in the nucleus as well. There is also genetic material in the plastid, okay? So just be aware of that, okay? All right, now, that, this slide was not from your textbook, from, it's from um, the Campbell textbook, um, but I just really like it, okay. All right, now, this is from your textbook, okay, and it's very similar, okay. It's showing you have a, you start out with a prokaryotic cell, you get invagination, or enfolding's another word which might work better than invagination, enfolding to give you your membrane system endomembrane system and your uh, nuclear membrane. Now, they're showing that ancestral eukaryote cell with the nucleus and the endomembrane system engulfing an aerobic bacterium. It establishing itself as a mitochondrion and that process is endosymbiosis, okay? And we'll often call it primary endosymbiosis, okay? Some of these cells will end up engulfing a photosynthetic bacterium, which will establish itself as a chloroplast, okay? So there can be one endosymbiosis event to give rise to heterotrophs that do not do photosynthesis, and another one to give rise to phototrophs that do photosynthesis, okay? So here we go at photosynthetic, but you could also say phototrophic, okay? Feeds with sunlight. Okay, so I really want you to understand this rise of eukaryotes, okay? Now the evidence supporting this endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts, okay? When, you, when scientists have compared mitochondria to bacteria and chloroplasts to bacteria, what they have found is that the mitochondria and chloroplasts, the membranes, contain enzymes and transport proteins homologous to those in the plasma membranes of prokaryotes, okay? I'm gonna break this down for you. So you know from bio one that the inner membrane of the mitochondria contains the proteins for the electron transport chain and for ATP synthase, okay? So does the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. Those same 
essentially homologs of those the electron transport chain and ATP synthase is also found in the plasma membrane of prokaryotes. Okay, so you see similar proteins and enzymes in the mitochondria membrane, chloroplast membrane, as well as prokaryotic membranes. Next, mitochondria and chloroplast divide by binary fission, just like prokaryotes. Okay. All right, and 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 what we're really specifically saying is like bacteria. Okay. And actually, this this slide got cut off. Darn it. Okay. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both have single circular chromosomes. So just one singular cr circular chromosome, like prokaryotes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have 70S ribosomes. I've used this word before. 70S ribosomes like prokaryotes do. Okay, Eukaryotes have 80S ribosomes. So a lot of evidence saying that mitochondria and chloroplasts are prokaryotes. Now, which prokaryote do they, are they, is it an archaea? Or a bacteria. I've been saying bacteria, and unfortunately, this slide got cut off, um, which is unfortunate. So you're going to have to make a note to say that the ribosomal RNA, so mitochondria do have ribosomes, and chloroplasts have ribosomes, right? Um, the ribosomal RNA from mitochondria and chloroplasts fall in the domain bacteria, okay? If you sequence the ribosomal RNA from mitochondria, and chloroplasts, and then you put in a computer program, you ask which domain it falls in, it falls in bacteria, okay? So the ancestors, of, so mitochondria and chloroplasts are most closely related to bacteria, okay? Okay, so I've corrected it so you can see that the ribosomal RNA from mitochondria and chloroplasts fall in the domain bacteria is telling you, uh, that they arose from bacteria. Now there is some speculation that um, the engulfing prokaryote, because the engulfing prokaryote may have been a um, the, the initial prokaryote that did the engulfing here to give rise to the proto-eukaryote, this original prokaryote, might have been an archaea. Okay, and that is because our eukaryotes have some things in common with bacteria and some things in common with archaea okay but i do want you to know mitochondria and chloroplasts derive from bacteria okay? and i've got all that evidence there if you have any questions let me know all right so now on this tree of life okay we've already covered that the earliest prokaryotes right are roughly equidistant from the root of the tree those evolved first. Now, look, we have already mentioned that the earliest eukaryote is this far away. Okay, so it took some time. All of these things here, okay, I don't need you to memorize them, but notice ciliates, we're going to mention that term and you would have read it in your lab manual by now. Flagellates, okay, I'm not going to mention these two right now. You will hear me use the word diplomonad in this lecture. Amoeba, you're familiar with from lab, I'll very, very briefly mention some slime molds. But all of these branches here, these are all proteists. Okay, they're all proteists. Whereas if you see here for animals, fungi, and plants, there's only one branch. One branch for animals, one branch for fungi, one branch for plants, lots and lots of branches for proteists. So what that tells us is that proteases evolved multiple times independently. There were multiple evolutionary events that gave rise to proteases. And it's a very, very broad grouping, okay, with a lot of genetic diversity. Okay. Whereas all the animals are on one branch, so all the animals are relatively closely related to each other, okay? Same, all the fungi are relatively closely related to each other. Plants all relatively closely related, but the proteins are all over the place. Okay, multiple um, lineages. Okay. B 
because of these multiple lineages, we do not use the term kingdom proteist, okay? Kingdom refers to organisms that are more genetically related. So we do not use the word kingdom. Instead, the method to describe eukaryotes when referring to proteists is called the supergroup system. Okay, so in this chapter, we're going to be using the term supergroups. Okay, so the proteins get divided into supergroups. Now, you will notice in some of the supergroups that animals, fungi, and plants are included as well. Okay, so, but when discussing proteins, we use supergroups, we do not use kingdoms. When we get to animals, fungi, and plants, we will use kingdoms because it's just one branch. Okay, so what I want you to know is there is a great deal of genetic diversity among the proteists. Okay, now the reason I put this as outdated is because this labeling is going to look very different than what you're going to see in the supergroup labeling. Okay, this is just to show you lots of branch points. Okay, but you're going to, for studying and for your exams, you're going to use all the future slides. There's just some value in this slide. All right. Now, um, one of the most fun things I think to do is to look at pond water. Okay. Uh, if you look at just some like pond water, creek pond water, you put it under the microscope and you see lots and lots of organisms moving around. Okay. A lot of those organisms moving around are proteists. Okay. Um, Proteases can be unicellular or multicellular. Okay. They can be photosynthetic, phototrophic, or heterotrophic. So in a thing of pond water, you can find clear colored, non-pigmented organisms, or you can find pigmented ones that can do photosynthesis. Okay. So Proteas are primarily aquatic, okay? Remember, early Earth was full of water, okay? And what you're going to see through this class is we're taking how organisms, the earliest ones evolved were in water because water is essential for life, but then they had to get some adaptations to get onto land. Well, proteas are early eukaryotes, so they're really tied to water, okay? Um, Okay, so I will try to put, I haven't done it yet, but I will put some links up on uh, Blackboard where you can watch some of these proteists um, it moving, like basically just YouTube videos where people uh, made videos of pond water microscopy. Okay, now as more information, as more genetic information becomes available, the genetic relatedness of all these proteins change. That's why that slide I had just shown you said was outdated, okay? Now, what you'll see is the most textbooks, you know how we say used in old edition, a lot of the content in textbooks isn't gonna change, like things about aerobic respiration, transcription and translation are pretty established. The one thing that does change is protease classification system, okay? And the relatedness between proteins genetically. And so that's something that is always, always gonna change, okay? So that's one way you see that science isn't static, <coughs> that we're constantly changing our understanding of relationships between organisms, okay, as we get more and more information. A lot of that information is uh, information on the genes, the proteins, okay? Um, that's what, and I just mentioned, so polyphyletic, Poly means many, so many branching, many, many branching group. So that's why protease is not a kingdom, okay? So one hypothesis divides all eukaryotes into supergroups, and see I have a typo here already, okay? Because a previous book used four supergroups, now this textbook is using six, okay? So let me go ahead and edit that. Okay. So, and what you'll see as I go through the supergroups, I am going to skip one of them, okay? So the exact number 
doesn't really matter because it does it's going to keep changing all right so you do want to remember that proteins are eukaryotes okay they have organelles okay now you will see proteins can be unicellular or multicellular okay proteins be can be unicellular or multicellular okay so we will go through examples of protein. There's an abundance of protein in nature. I can't by any means go through all of them. We're just, I'm just gonna be picking some examples and I'm gonna to try to pick examples that match what you've got in lab. But note, there's a lot more okay, in nature. Now, also keep in mind that most protein in nature benefit the environment, okay? Um, they do photosynthesis, many of them, okay, and contribute to an oxygenic environment. Many of them um, are part of the food chain, okay? So they will eat bacteria and then larger organisms will eat them, okay? So they're important in that way. Um, they're decomposers, okay? So most are beneficial in the environment there's very very few that cause disease okay now so i'm going to mostly i'm this term colonial i'm not even going to mention really but let's focus with unicellular and multicellular it's both now reproduction it, they are eukaryotes okay so they do mitosis and meiosis Now, asexual reproduction is mitosis. The, and I need to edit this. Wow, I really needed to. Okay, so I cleaned up this slide. Okay, so proteins can be unicellular or multicellular. Some reproduce asexually, some reproduce sexually, some do both. Now, we are not going into detail on protein reproduction. It's just not practical, okay? It can vary quite a bit, okay? And there can be unique methods of sexual reproduction, okay? Or other unique methods of reproduction in general. So for the purpose of this class on your chart where it asks protease rep reproduction, it's just either sexual or asexual, okay? Okay. Now, for for nutrition, because I add about ask about mode of nutrition, okay? Now, I, I don't know if I use the term mode of nutrition in the prokaryotic slide, but what I mean by mode of nutrition is how do they get nutrients? And usually it's going to be either heterotroph, which is the same as chemoheterotroph, or phototroph, right? Which does photosynthesis and makes its own organic compounds. Those are the main choices. Okay. Proteasts are going to be phototrophs. Now we can say photoautotroph or just phototroph. It doesn't matter. Okay. They can be phototrophs that have their have chloroplasts and do photosynthesis. Some proteasts are heterotrophs, which take up organic carbon. Okay. They can either take up organic carbon by absorption or by ingestion and we're primarily going to talk about the ingestion method with proteasts okay just like we eat organic carbon compounds so do some proteins like plants photosynthesize and make their own carbon so do some proteasts okay so you want to remember they're both in lab okay in lab that chapter the section on proteasts I'll actually, let me go check the lab and make sure. Okay, what your lab manual does, and I will do that at the end of this lecture, okay? Your lab manual divides proteins into two categories, okay? One category is algae. The other category is protozoa, okay? Algae and protozoa are not genetic classifications, Okay. So you will not hear algae and protozoa as genetic classifications in this lecture. Okay. They are 
functional classifications, okay? Nothing to do with their genetic relatedness, but how do they function, okay? And often we use the term algae and protozoa, these functional characterizations, just because it makes it a little easier, okay? So algae are functionally characterized as phototrophs, okay? So algae are phototrophs, your photosynthetic organisms that have chloroplasts and pigment. And algae can be multicellular or unicellular. Okay. Protozoa, that characterization, protozoa are all heterotrophs that ingest their, ingest organic carbon, do not have chloroplasts, cannot do photosynthesis, okay, and they are not pigmented. Okay, so they don't capture light. So in pond water specimens, hopefully I'll put some links up, the algae, now algae can be unicellular or multicellular. There's a lot of unicellular algae. They will have color, okay? Pigment would be green, brown, gold, those kind of colors to capture light. Whereas the protozoa would mostly be clear, okay? Because they're not capturing light. Sometimes you might see some color inside because they've eaten some photosynthetic organisms, okay? And so it could be the color of what they've eaten inside them. Now, there's a third category called mixotrophs, okay? And there are proteins that can do both photosynthesis and heterotrophic nutrition. So there are organisms that can alternate, okay? In the right conditions with a lot of light, these organisms can do photosynthesis, okay? They'll have the structures to be able to do photosynthesis and make their own carbon, but if light is blocked, okay? If they don't have light, then they can switch to heterotrophic nutrition where they, where they consume organic matter. Okay, so they're really flexible. They can do both, okay? So proteins can be phototrophs, heterotrophs, or mixotrophs that do both photosynthesis and heterotrophy. Okay. Now, this is the picture from your textbook, okay? This Raven book that shows, here would be the phylogenetic tree of life. Here's the root, you see domain Another name for domain bacteria is eubacteria. EU means true, true, so true bacteria. I don't often use the term eubacteria. I'll pretty much just say bacteria, but they're synonyms. Okay, so you see domain bacteria, you see domain archaea, and then you have this system, a supergroup system, takes all the eukaryotes and divides them into six supergroups. So supergroup one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you the names of these supergroups. There's supergroup S excavata, okay? There's supergroup chromalveolata. There's supergroup rhizaria, which I will not cover. Okay, I'm not gonna cover that supergroup. There's supergroup archaeplastida, and there's supergroup Amoebozoa, and their supergroup Apistaconta. But I want you to be aware that supergroup Apistaconta exists. It will come up later when we talk about fungi and animals, okay? But it's not going to come up in this lecture. This lecture is going to focus on Amoebozoa, Archaeplastida, Chromalveolata, and excavata. Okay. And yes, I know within each of these groupings, there's a number of words and it may look a little overwhelming, but just stay with me. Okay. And I'll break it down for you. What I do want you to notice is fungi and algae and animals are within epistaconts. And so those will come up later when we talk about fungi and animals. I want you to know that land plants are within Archaeplastida. So I want you to retain that land plants are within Archaeplastida, okay? Um, 
and I guess let's just go ahead and get started and we'll start walking through. And really the point here is this is a survey of organisms, okay? This is a survey of protein, so it's going to be somewhat broad with just some examples. Okay. So we're going to start out with excavata, okay? Now, I don't personally care too much that you memorize these terms diplomonids, parabasalids, and euglenozoa because it gets a little bit much, okay? But I'm going to give you examples of these in the coming, in the next slides, okay? Okay, so the organisms that I'm going to cover in Escavata have a structure that's called a flagella, okay? A flagella is used for motility, okay? And unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of a flagella here, but the flagella is essentially a microtubule. If you took bio one, you remember microtubule, okay? So a eukaryotic flagella is made up of a bunch of cylinder-shaped proteins, okay? Eukaryotic flagella are visible in the microscope. And the function of flagella is for movement, okay? To allow organisms to move, why are they moving? They're either moving to escape predation, being eaten, or they're moving to a food source, okay? So it turns out uh, proteins have three main methods of moving, okay? And I'll show you these as we walk through. One is using flagella. Another is using cilia, okay? Another is using a structure called pseudopods. So proteins are aquatic and motile, and they use specific structures for their motility. Okay. So here is showing a unicellular protease with an excavata, which is called euglena, okay? So you saw that euglenozoa thing, okay? Now, euglena are quite lovely. So here's a flagella, here's a flagella, and they, you, they move around, they basically whip the flagella, and that allows them to move around, okay? Um, they often have this reddish eye spot, which detects light and helps them move to or away from light. They are eukaryotic, so you've got a nucleus, Euglena are often mixotrophs. Not all. There's many, many euglena, but you see this one is green, so it can do some phototrophy, but also, if needed, it can do heterotrophy. But this, notice this is a unicellular protist. Okay, that's a mixotroph. Okay, and it is flagellated. Okay. Now, more of the structures that you and so what you could see. So then there's I think like chloroplast showing here, nucleus. Sometimes you'll, and I think it's, yeah, I'll, I'll get, sorry, I was trying to remember what was in your lab, but okay, that, I think I've said what I needed to say about euglena, okay, mixotrophic, flagellated, G, and they're harmless, okay, they're loaded up in water systems and they're just completely harmless, they're part of the ecosystem and food chain. Giardia is found in waterways. Giardia are flagellated as well. So here is these flagella. Giardia moved by flagella. Giardia can cause human disease, okay? It can cause a disease, giardiasis, which is a gastrointestinal disorder where you basically have diarrhea, watery diarrhea, okay? How you get giardia is from consuming water contaminated with this protozoan. Our water is nice and well treated and filtered and so we don't get it, but if you were to go camping or something and drink water from a natural source that's not a spring and you don't filter or treat that water properly, let's say boiling or putting it through a filtration system that removes the giardia or treating with iodine, you could contract giardia, okay, and then get diarrhea. So normal in waterways, but it can be an intestinal parasite, okay, if unsanit unsanitary water is consumed, okay. That would be a, I'm pretty sure Giardia is a heterotroph, okay. Trypanosomes, okay, those also move by flagella. It's maybe not the easiest to see in the, pic this picture doesn't point it out terribly well. I think the, oh, it's, 
yeah, the flagellum here, it's kind of all along the body and it tapers down into this thin. So this long thing, oh, that's the flagellum. Okay, so trypanosomes move with flagella. You should have gotten this in your lab manual, okay? Trypanosomes are blood parasites, okay? So they live in the bloodstream, but they don't live inside the blood cells, okay? So if someone was infected with a trypanosome, and if you extracted their blood, you would see red blood cells, and then you would see these trypanosomes. And they have this funky shape because they have their mem membrane is this, has this undulating membrane. Okay. Trypanosomes typically cause two diseases. Okay. One is African trypanosomiasis, and African trypanosomiasis is African sleeping sickness. Okay. And the, that trypanosome is transmitted by the tsetse fly. Okay. There is a different species of trypanosome, okay, that causes, so there's two different, there's different species of trypanosomes. I don't remember exactly the names of them right the second. Trypanosome is genus name, by the way. Giardia is genus name. Euglena is genus name. The other trypanosome, the other species, causes American trypanosomiasis. And American trypanosomiasis is called Chagas disease. Okay? Oh, yeah, it's trypanosome brucei and trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma brucei causes African sleeping sickness. Trypanosoma cruzi leads to Chagas disease or American trypanosomiasis. And Chagas disease um, leads to uh, various fatigue symptoms and the trypanosome can get to various parts of the, the system and depending, depending on where in the human system it resides you're going to get different symptoms. Okay, But you are getting inflammation symptoms of the immune system Okay, and you're going to be getting things like fatigue and it's actually kind of difficult to diagnose because you know, it's a lot of symptoms that are common to a bunch of other diseases. But the reason I bring up that trypanosomes not, can cause um, Chagas disease is because Chagas disease is found in Texas. Okay, it is found in South America. Okay, it's um, transmitted by the triatamine bug. Okay, and because we are, it's found in South and Latin America, and of course, Texas is close to South and Latin America. We do all, and it's also found in tropical climate. So we do have some Chagas disease in Texas. And last I had heard the Houston Health Department, the Texas Health Department does track cases, and you could Google that and find that. Okay. So I want you to know that some of these proteins in supergroup Escovada cause disease, but many of them don't. And I want you to know these three examples, Euglena, Giardia, and Trypanosomes. Their mode of motility, it was with flagella, okay? And you see they're unicellular, okay? If you have any questions about these, just let me know. Okay. So notice I'm being a little bit brief on all of these. So if you have any additional questions, just ask, okay? And the lab manual should supplement some information as well, okay? The next group, Chromia alveolata, you realize that's a quite a large group, okay? And so I'm going to give you some examples here. Now, if you're using um, an older textbook um, with, like, the Campbell one, it would call, it would put these things in the SAR group, okay? For the purpose of our, my exams, go ahead and use these slides because, you know, I can't kind of cover every textbook. All right, so for supergroup chromalveolata, notice how broad it is. You have brown algae, and you got that covered in your lab manual. Brown algae, you know, is multicellular. Okay, so these are all pictures of brown algae. And the one that, hopefully I'll have a better picture of it. I should have made this one bigger, but the typical golden um, algae that you see on the beach in Galveston, those are going to be your, um, it's called sargassum, okay? So sargassum is one of your really common 
um, brown algaes that you see. And obviously it's multicellular. Okay. Um, hopefully you got um, in your lab manual, it you uh, unfortunately I don't have this big enough, but if you go back to your lab manual and you would look picture, there would see these little bulbs. Okay, these little bulbs, and those were the air sacs, right? So they, they're called bladders. So if you ever go on the beach, you see these little bulbous things, and those are air sacs that allow that algae to float because you find it floating on the surface. And it needs gas sacs to help it float so that it can capture the light for photosynthesis, okay? Brown algae is pigmented. It's photosynthetic, okay? It's multicellular. Okay. Um, the other things you probably would have noticed in the lab manual besides the bladders is they have a hold fast. Okay. Um, I don't know if there was anything else I needed to mention. Okay. But brown algae in chromial valta is multicellular, photosynthetic. One of the more common ones is sargassum that you see at the beach all the time. Diatoms. Okay. Diatoms are quite lovely to look at under the microscope. Okay. So this is a picture of many diatoms, okay? Um, I don't know that you could get the sense of it that much, but they're very symmetrical, okay? They're really pretty. Um, and notice they are pigmented, okay? So they are pigmented, so they are photosynthetic. Now, okay, now I need to also back up with some things here, okay? For trypanosomes, giardia, and euglena, I'm not sure about euglena, but trypanosomes, their outermost structure is a cell membrane. Okay. So for proteins, some proteins have a cell wall and some do not. Okay. Algae, algae, the functional group algae that's photosynthetic has a cell wall. Okay. The functional group protozoa that is not photosynthetic does not have a cell wall, okay? I know trypanosoma would fall under functionally protozoa, so would giardia, and these two do not have cell walls. They're more like animal cells where the outermost structure is the cell membrane, okay? Okay, and I had to just look it up, and euglena do not have a cell wall, okay? Now, brown algae do have a cell wall okay so algae has cell walls protozoa do not algae are photosynthetic protozoa are not algae can be unicellular or multicellular protozoa would be unicellular okay all right so brown algae have a cell wall made of cellulose they're basically the ants they're you know very similar to plants okay they're just aquatic Okay, so brown algae are aquatic. Now, diatoms are, of course, aquatic as well. Okay, notice the pigment. So they're photosynthetic. Okay, functionally, they would be algae. Um, genetically, they're chromial velata. Now, the cell walls of diatoms are made of silica. When you think of silica, silica is sand. Okay, and sand is used to make glass. So diatoms have silica cell walls, algae have cellulose. Now these silica cell walls are interesting because if a diet, when a diatom dies, okay, what's gonna be left behind is that silica cell wall, okay? Um, and what's really kind of cool is that diatoms, once they're dead, they can be used, their carcasses, that silica cell walls can be used to make diatomaceous earth. And diatomaceous earth can be used for filtration. You may have heard of sand for filtering, right? You can put things through it and, you know, uh, let's say small organisms or uh, contaminants can bind to the sand and then the water come through, can come through. So diatomaceous earth can be used as filtration method. I've heard, I think, diatomaceous earth could be used to like kind of kill cockroaches because if they eat it, that glass, the diatom diatoms glass, Basically, sand can come in and cut their intestines, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Okay, but, and these, uh, the way the diatoms move, if you look at them in the microscope, they don't have um, flagella 
they seem to kind of like glide and slide. They seem to have a gliding kind of motion. And um, I can't really, I don't know a lot about that gliding mot motion, so I can't tell you a lot about it. But these are abundant, very, very abundant in aquatic systems and pond water. They're quite beautiful. Okay, also within, so Chromial Delta has brown algae, diatoms. Okay, next we're going to do dinoflagellates, ciliates, and apicomplexans. Okay, we may finish these in this video or we may have to finish them in the next. So dinoflagellates, okay, so these are some examples of dinoflagellates, okay, they are pigmented and they are photosynthetic, okay, um, pretty sure they're, they're unicellular and they're found in aquatic systems, okay. Some dinoflagellates um, associate with coral, okay, and provide uh, photosynthetic uh, products, carbon for coral. Some di dinoflagellates do bioluminescence. So if you ever see starlight in water, that could be some dinoflagellates. So there's a, a high abundance of dinoflagellates. Notice because of the term flagellate, they are flagellated. They move with flagella, okay? Some dinoflagellates cause what's called red tide, okay? And that is in often in the summer months with high temperatures, you can get large dinoflagellate blooms and you'll often hear them called as algal blooms, okay? So dinoflagellates are pigmented and photosynthetic so they would fall under the functional category of algae. But under the right conditions, they can overgrow and you can get algal blooms. And you, because they are pigmented, you can often get the color of the ocean tinted. Okay, so these are marine mostly. Uh, well, there might be some aquatic, but we're familiar with it marine, okay, in the ocean. You'll get the tint, and notice it's a somewhat brown or reddish tint, and that gives the name red tide. Okay. Now, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's every summer these dinoflagellate algal blooms that cause red tide. And so there's you are probably somewhat familiar with sometimes in the summer, in Texas and Florida and the restaurants, they'll be like, well, you know, there are these periods where we're not necessarily serving certain fish or certain shellfish. Okay. And that is because some of these dinoflagellates that cause red tide produce neurotoxins. Okay. Now fish and shellfish are going to scavenge and eat these diatoms, right? So they'll eat these diatoms. That'll produce, not all of these produce neurotoxins. This is one of them that does, gunyolix. So it will eat it, and then that neurotoxin will accumulate in the fish and the shellfish. Okay? If you are to eat a fish and shellfish, fish or shellfish that has that neurotoxin accumulated, then you'll take in that neurotoxin. And it's a neurotoxin, so it's going to mess with your sensory system, right? So you'll have all these kind of impaired sensory issues, but also when you're messing with the neurosystem, you can also affect the pulse rate, muscle weakness, impaired respiration, diarrhea. So there are certain times where there are warnings, do not consume fish and shellfish during these red tide periods because there's chances of accumulation of the neurotoxins. And there are, um, I don't know if they're part of the public health department or whatever, but there are people that go and test the waters and they're monitoring for red tide. Okay, but no, that's caused by dinoflagellates. Not all of them cause red tide. Many of them cause no problem at all. Okay, but just wanted you to be aware of that. All right, now the next one is going to be about malaria and that falls under apicomplexin, but I'm going to stop here. Okay, because I'm not going to be able to finish this in this video.